Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Back in the USSR here on 93.3 FM CFRU. And one of the things that the thing I really want to talk about tonight is something which I haven't actually dealt with that much in the last uh, in the last while yet. It's been, you know, just exploding all over the media and, you know, constant attention being paid to this. And of course, I'm talking about the conflict which is going on in Korea right now. So to talk about this very important subject, I have Jason Unruh of Maoist Rebel News with me on the phone. And uh, Jason, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So, uh, Jason, you've been really been following this like really, really big time on your show, Maoist Rebel News, for uh, quite some time now. And uh, just the kind of... Because, of course, all we hear about in the mainstream media is the constant demonization of North Korea. And, uh, and of course, I found like your, um, your reports very, very helpful in terms of cutting through that, as I have for quite some time. So, just in terms of how... Um, just getting, jumping right into it, um, looking at the origin of the, the present um, crisis... As we see, it seems to be a matter of like U.S. escalation, doesn't it? Uh, say that last part again. It seems to be a matter of like the U.S. once again um, really being behind this this whole escalation, really blaming it on North Korea. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely that. I certainly, I think uh, this really stems from the satellite launch, which they had said over and over and over again was a cover for a, a missile test. Mm-hmm. But uh, North Korea took the, uh, the, the took the they, they, they did the right thing. They let the entire world's media walk in and inspect, you know, the satellite to inspect the rocket and let everybody come in, everybody look at it, launched it into space. There is now a North Korean satellite in space, but it's still a missile test. Yeah, and of course we've been hearing nothing like about considering that entire thing, which that was last November, I believe. And um, the entire time in the Western media, even though they were the North Koreans were very clearly letting in these, you know, all manner of representatives and stuff, they still say it's a missile test. So, and there, of course, were UN sanctions based on that um, that satellite launch, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, the the sanctions were based on a violation of an agreement which the launch did not violate. That's that's the whole what catalyze the whole thing. That's what they're basing the sanctions on, that they have violated the agreement on missile tests. But there was no missile test. We saw that it was launching a satellite into space. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so it seems like once again we have like the United States kind of um, basically trying to, trying to batch one of these few last socialist holdouts, you could say, socialist countries in the world, um, and trying to really impose its will. On this country, of course, is like right on China's border, and of course provides a um, kind of a. There's certain strategic reasons behind why the United States is doing this. Yeah, of course, there's there's all kinds of interests. Uh, North Korea is like practically the only state in the world that's basically saying "f you." Uh, we are not going to be controlled in any way, shape, or form, and are willing to go to any extreme in order to maintain that independence. Uh, but North Korea itself has uh, d- d- tremendous benefits to anybody who, who could get their hands on it. It was recently reported, uh, actually just reported, uh, I believe it was uh, earlier this year, that a survey found there's about $6 trillion worth of rare earth metals in the country within the mountains. And that would be extremely valuable. Not to mention, um, if the U.S. was to get a hold of North Korea, they would have literally uh, military bases on the border with China. And that's something China can absolutely not accept. Mm-hmm. So, and it's very, very interesting to see that how we could kind of get to this stage where, like, you know, there's various pundits even talking about nuclear war over this particular issue. Because, as I understand it, like, even in the, in the uh, like, during the 1990s, there was a major agreement between uh, the United States and, um, and North Korea that there was going to be, like, some sort of, like, uh, reciprocity. They were going to get... Uh, uh, what was it? Maybe a light water nuclear reactor or something like that to produ- to replace the one it already has, and uh, in order and there were security guarantees and all kinds of stuff to prevent the United States, the North Korea from going nuclear. And um, f- from what I I can tell, like the U.S. was the one that tore up that agreement. Um, yeah. Is that is that the case? Yeah, basically they just never li- lived up to their end of the agreement. Mm-hmm. It was just basically okay. We got what we wanted. Screw you. Yeah, because yeah, because that was going on like that was like the Clinton administration, wasn't it? Yeah, that was under that was uh, Clinton, and largely had to do with uh, talks with uh, Madeleine Albright, mm-hmm. who I believe now is retired. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I believe she is. But of course, she she was of course the one who said that the sanctions that were killing millions of people in Iraq were worth it. So <laughs> definitely not someone to be celebrated. But yeah, so so in the um, 
And of course, North Korea being named as, uh, as soon as George Bush takes power, basically names him as the uh, part of the axis of evil. Yeah, the axis of evil was like one of the one of the biggest jokes. Um, listing Iran as the axis of evil was silly because it had it has very limited ability to do anything offensively, mm-hmm. and then to list Cuba, which has no offensive ability whatsoever. Yeah, which is ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, but of course, going into this uh, this whole thing, um, really to the bottom of this, which you never really hear talked about in the mainstream media whatsoever, is the history of wa- of this entire dispute, the entire conflict on the Korean Peninsula, and I believe the Korea, seeing the Korea for the like thousands of years before, like I think 1945 was a unified country, and now it's one of the most heavily militarized and divided places in the world. So maybe talk a little bit about the history of the Korean Peninsula and how we really started to got to this point. Well, I don't really know much about the feudal area, or at least the the end of the kingdoms. Uh, it, 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 r- relatively, the two forces came into Korea when that it came to the end. That was communism, and it was capitalism, or mm. uh, the, more particular, more specifically, the U.S. brand of capitalism. And uh, it, it has to do largely with with the idea of a unified Korea. Mm-hmm. As long as one is socialist and one is capitalist, there will not be a unified Korea. It's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. One has to win out over the other. One has to transform into the other. The dialectic just has to take its course. Yeah. There's not going to be, you know, one, like, yeah, like I said, one has to transform into the other. And until that happens, there will never be a, a unified Korea. Uh, this is completely different interest and independent North Korea. Although I, I was like the, the how they claimed that it was just a satellite state of the Soviet Union, and the only reason there was a, there was a North Korea is because you know the, the USSR was forcing it. So where's it been? Then why is it still yeah. there? Yeah, exactly. This is like twenty years after the fall of the Soviet Union, and that's that still only, enduring. Yeah, if that was the only reason it was there, why is it still there? Mm-hmm. Because it's independent, and I would say that the DPRK is probably more independent than any country in the world. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, certainly pursuing a very independent foreign policy. Yes, and un- unfortunately, it, given the global imperialist system, that comes at a very heavy price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it seems like always North Korea is this kind of island in, you know, say a socialist island in a capitalist sea, you might almost call it. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, in terms of the origins of the Korean War, though, of course, the you said the war that really split, um, saw this kind of like permanent militarization of the uh, the Korean Peninsula, and um, that I believe that it was Japan that colonized North Korea, say around 1900, I think it was, yes, and colonized Korea, um, a long and very very brutal occupation, which I believe uh, Kim Il Sung. Of course, that was the first leader of North Korea was intimately involved in resisting that occupation. Yes. Yeah, he was. Um, and so, of course, um, if I remember correctly, was it the uh, then Russia, which, of course, had invaded um, northern China to, to defeat the Japanese towards the end of uh, at the beginning of 1945. And um, and the United States basically intervened in South Korea to prevent it from uh, going, you know, say, falling to the. The Soviets. Yes, that that is what actually happened. Yeah, uh, there was uh, there was a struggle afterwards between the North and the South, and uh, the North was going to win. Mm-hmm. And but of course, who? Uh, how did that that kick off? I mean, who, what was the really the instigating uh, force? Because we hear in like a lot of the mainstream, say, history textbooks and stuff, that was the North Korean just unilaterally invading the South in uh, what was it like nineteen forty? Was it forty nine or nineteen fifty? Uh, yeah, I don't remember the exact year, but yeah, um, yeah you had two of uh, these two completely opposing forces. I mean, to either to say that either one is is responsible, I don't really think makes makes much sense. They were going to go to war no matter what. Mm-hmm. It was like it was like the um, it was like the moment of World War One. All the in, all the empires had reached the end of their borders, and for them to expand any further. They were going to have to go to war with each other. Mm-hmm. Nobody was really more guilty than anyone else. It was just a symptom of the conflict that existed, because these countries were in contradiction. They were going to go to war no matter what. And when you have two completely diametrically opposed forces, uh, socialism and capitalism, 
yeah. one has to win out over the other. To say that it's really anyone's fault um, is it, not really, I think, a valid criticism. Uh, a, a better criticism would be to say whether or not it was the U.S. The U.S. had the right, or pardon me, the U.N. had the right to go in and stop the North from mm-hmm. buying the country. Yeah, um, because of course in this situation, like at this time, uh, I believe South Korea was a right-wing military dictatorship at this time, wasn't it? Yes. Mm-hmm. And it was until, I believe, the end of the Cold War. Uh, yes, it was. And they carried out, a, carried out quite, quite a few massacres. Like of their own people? Yes. And not even actually against North Koreans, like actually against South Koreans. Like they accuse them of collaborating with the North or uh, being communists, that sort, that sort of thing. Uh, somebody, it's uh, not any different really than what it is today. We only suspect you of something, and that's enough. Because mm-hmm. I believe the, yeah, because this legacy I believe is still in place. Because I think I heard on, I think it was press TV the other day, the current president of South Korea is in fact the daughter of a long-standing like South Korean dictator, like from the Cold War era. And, uh, of course, she's one of the most bellicose uh, anti-North Korean leaders I think they've had in a long time. Mm. Yeah, this is, this is what I heard. So, Yeah, he was a pretty bad dictator, and his, uh, his kid's running now. Yeah. Like, everybody's <laughs> just completely forgotten about what happened. Like, like what? Yeah. Because the fact that was brought up, it's like, what? Like, she's, she's the one in charge now? Like, it, like or should we really be surprised that kind of, you know, the fact that everything is blowing up now, like, considering he was in power? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think it really matters. It's to say that it's either her or uh, Lee Myung Bak or you right. know, the liberal before him. I mean, obviously, it's one of those things where if a conservative is in power, it, it is obviously going to be worse. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like saying it's like saying the Liberal Party here defends people's rights, as where the conservative party doesn't. Well, in fact, they both are. They're both a threat to people's rights. It's just one of them looks like it is, and. and one looks like yeah. it is, when they really are, both are. So I don't think um, the a recent acceleration may be because of that. Yeah. But in the overall scheme, I don't see it as making much of a difference because those hostilities would have been there anyway. They're just worse than they would have been. Yeah, because of course we have the class power, the class powers in in control in South Korea, who have their own agenda. Yeah. Like systemic agenda. Yeah. Um, Every every uh, every country has its own divisions within the ruling class itself, and it's just a matter of you know which set of interests is going to win out over another. Mm-hmm. And they're just the the uh, interests that tend to ally more with the right wing conservative parties are just they have more power right now. Yeah, because um, one of the things we constantly hear in the media how um, South Korea is supposedly this beacon of democracy and this. Uh, uh, you know, was it the 12th largest economy in the world or something like that? And yet it exploits its workers at a just a frightening to just a frightening degree. And I, I think it was like the highest rate of suicide in possibly in the world. Mm. This is this is uh, this is South Korea. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the rate of exploitation is insanely, insanely high. Um, a one good example of this is actually the show The Simpsons. You know, the, the oh, yeah. cartoon? <laughs> yeah, it's okay, made, yeah. It's made in Korea. Like, in terms of what, the animation? Yeah, the animation, the actual day-to-day animation is actually done by a company called Rough Draft Korea. And, like, this is done in a factory kind of setting? Like, people are doing this animation? Yeah, it's done in, in like, a, an assembly line kind of assembly line kind of a setting. Wow. And that's I did, I did, did not know that. No, if you actually watch the credits for the show, it'll say Rough Draft Korea. If I'm correct, this also goes for Future Rama and a couple other shows um, that were also yeah. by Matt Greening. By the, by the same guy. Yeah. Uh, in fact, <laughs> The Simpsons actually made a joke about it one time. Uh, they made a joke about it being uh, made in Korea once. I can't remember what the joke like was. Like, in some context, they, they yeah. said that. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, that's I'd say that says a lot. <laughs> um. I mean, because recently I was going through like this, um, like uh, teaching English overseas training, right? And like one of the, the top destination is like South Korea, because I guess they want, um, I guess because they want to train, you say, the future generation of elites in the English language, and it seems that that's one of their major, major things they want to do in order to integrate into the global economy, so to speak. Um, I would say that that's not really that much of a symptom of imperialism. 
speak specifically against Korea itself, mm -hmm. because North Korea puts uh, a great deal of emphasis on teaching people English. Really? Um, there's actually mm. a lot done uh, to make to make the country actually bilingual and that it can speak English and Korean, uh, particularly when it relates to uh, medical and technological stuff, uh, particularly in those fields of education, because uh, the vast majority of works are published in English. Mm -hmm. I so, mean, yeah. I mean, when you know this, it's scientific stuff gets published. It's going to be published in like depending, like regardless of where the country, what, what country publishes it, it's going to be in their native language, and it's going to be in English. Mm -hmm. So if and because all these things are all being published in English as well, you know, what's the point of learning all these other languages to get a hold of these, um, to get a hold of these scientific papers? You, you just teach English. Yeah. So like, where where would they get their English teachers from? Do you know that? Uh, the DPRK? Yeah. Uh, there's not many foreign uh, English teachers. Uh, a lot of them is just domestic. They've actually, uh, that, that's one of the, the great ironies of uh, being anti-imperialist is that in the end you still had to learn the colonizer's language anyway yeah. because the colonizer's language was so predominant within the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, I, I had absolutely no clue about that, uh, that whole situation there. Because um, I know... Uh, uh, going back to the whole factor of like uh, Korean reunification, um, something like ninety-one percent of South Koreans, or some insane number, actually wants this, and um, like, it's a pretty unbelievable number. I think even in uh, like on both sides of the border, but of course the international like system itself is totally opposed to that entire idea. Yeah, like you have. Um, I think it was Japan that does not want to unify Korea because they see it as an economic competitor. Uh, the U.S., of course, wants to maintain its uh, military control in South Korea, like 40,000 troops or whatever it is. Yeah. And, um, and I guess a unified Korea, of course, would make that redundant. And, um, and I think uh, China, of course, has interest in this as well. Um, but just, just even thinking about that, because the whole concept of unifica reunification, the way it's usually talked about, is okay, just, you know... North Korea just accepting the southern system and just integrating into South Korea, where it's like, well, they would never do that. Like, why would they ever want to do that? Like, especially now they're a nuclear armed state. And they're supposed to assimilate into this system, which we just talked about is terribly exploitative and goes against everything the North has traditionally stood for. Like, it just, it just it does not seem rational at all. Like, I mean, there would have to be, like, immense... Yeah, like it, dialogue, like uh, like respectful, and I, I just don't see that coming. No, it's because the U.S. really doesn't want it. I mean, it, it's it's very easy to, to point to the fact that uh, the vast majority of people in both the North and the South do want reunification. Mm. There, there's no question of that. They want it. They don't really like their country being divided. You know, no more than any other country would really want to be divided like mm -hmm. that. But it, it's not just a simple matter of what people want. Yeah, you know it's more complicated. It's not just you know you can't just want it and then make it exist. It's it's tremendously more complicated than that. You have two competing uh, two competing uh, political and economic systems, which is a large part of that division. So it's not a matter of just wanting it. There there really is huge competing forces, and a unified Korea would be extremely powerful, assuming that it wasn't a. Um, you know, a colony of somebody else. Yeah. I mean, North, North Korea has a, a tremendous amount of industrialization, far more than people realize. A lot of it, it gives the, like, you know, you usually don't see these things. They just say, oh, look, here's this prison camp on a satellite photo. Oh, here's this farm in the middle of nowhere. There's actually an extraordinary amount of industrialization that just takes place. And uh, a lot of it was recently renewed, like uh, an acceleration of industrialization under Kim Jong-un. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the things that... Uh, that when he came in, that he said, okay, we need to go into a second round of industrialization. And uh, that's why you had, like, all these things popping up now. We got, like, all these new computers, uh, flat screen monitors, upgrades in satellite technology. There's been a massive burst in that once again. I mean, in terms of um, technological development, they've actually exploded since uh, he came into power. And that's what's given him a lot of credibility. I mean, it's not a straight dictatorship where, you know, he has unruled, you know, unquestionable authority or anything like that. Because he himself barely managed to stay in power when they voted on whether or not he would be the head of the Korean Workers' Party. I mean, a lot of people obviously took him one because he had a, he has a, he has a really good education, and two he has the family name. I mean, right. 
I mean, come on, they do the same thing here. I mean, would anybody <laughs> care anything about George Bush if um, if he wasn't his father's son? His father's son. Would Justin Trudeau be anywhere near the head of the Liberal Party right now if he was not Pierre Trudeau's son? <laughs> yeah, it's like, what's in a name, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, because you don't hear anything about, like, say, North Korean development or anything like that. You just hear it's like this somehow poor, backward country. But they sometimes will let slip that it's one of the most literate countries in the world. And stuff. It's like, well, how does that, how does that square with your general picture of an impoverished, you know, third world backwater? Yeah, it's, it's just one of those things that, um, you know, is really important for life, but people generally just don't pay attention to it. Um, you know, what is it? Venezuela, Cuba, and North Korea have the highest literacy rates in the world. Mm-hmm. And the country with the highest literacy rate in Africa is ironically... Um, Zimbabwe. And yep. <laughs> Zimbabwe. Is, I, I'm always reminded of the internet meme, you know, from uh, I, where is the picture of, um, oh, I keep forgetting his name. He's on the phone. He says, I don't know who you are. I'm going to find you and I'm going to kill you. Okay. Picture Robert Mugabe on the phone and it says, <laughs> um, hey, economy, I don't know how you work, but I am going to find you and I am going to kill you. <laughs> because, but then again, the problems in Zimbabwe are you know, a whole different matter completely. Well, that's but, like, yeah, but, in Africa yeah, in general. Despite all their difficulties they have, they still have the highest literacy rate in uh, Africa, which is actually even higher than Libya under Gaddafi, which is a... No, th- wow. Is really something in itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's pretty incredible. And, and of course, seeing that... Um, I believe North Korea, in fact, was far more developed than South Korea for, like, at least the vast majority of it, its history. Um, yeah. Up until about the uh, the 80s, it was actually yeah. far, far ahead. Yeah, seeing that, uh, you know, South Korea is this kind of, like, largely an impoverished right-wing dictatorship ruled by a deeply corrupt government. Which is actually ironic because the state there ran a lot of things, too. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they always say, well, if the government does, it'll ruin it. Yet we literally had, you know, the state running things on both sides. Uh, the North obviously had the state running more than things in the South, but the development of the South was... I mean, the development in the North actually took off better because it went by a national plan. And it was an extremely successful plan. Mm-hmm. I mean, basically, it went out to, went from a completely bombed out, you know, flat land to, uh, you know, a, a tremendous uh, position, industrialized position, given the conditions it actually faced. Yeah. Cause it, and, and it was, too. I mean, I was, I was going to bring that up, like the fact that... Um, didn't, like, the United States, I believe, dropped more bombs, like, on North Korea than it did on Japan and Germany combined in the Second World War. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and like, somebody made a, I, I, it was Douglas MacArthur, one of these, uh, you know, imperialist generals serving the United States, saying, like, you know, there's no way Pyongyang would ever rise from the ashes again. It's been bombed back to the Stone Age. There's no, no way. And yet, within, like, a matter of a few years, it's, like being rebuilt because they had uh, they had effective planning and they had uh, they had the expertise and all this sort of stuff and they actually just made just built it all up in a remarkable short period of time yeah it's amazing what you can actually accomplish when um you know you have com- when you don't have competing groups of rich people com- trying to cut each other down for their own benefit mm-hmm and so you say like and this is largely because of the system that the north koreans had in place that they were able to kind of make these kind of rapid advancements and um and I guess that would extend to, like, you know, staying afloat after the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, its major trading partner. I guess, it, I guess Cuba under, underwent, like, a, very, a kind of a similar uh, period where it was just undergoing all kinds of disasters, this is like, in the 90s, right? Yeah. Uh, in Cuba, it was called the special period. Yeah. I mean, they outright said, okay, look, things are going to get really, really bad because we've lost our, you know, our main trading partner. But uh, Castro went out and said, he said straight up, you know, things are going to get bad, but we promise you we will never cut health care and we will never cut education. Mm-hmm. Because he said those were the two fundamental things for human life, and they never did. Yeah. And uh, so, of course, yeah, because I guess what you hear in the, in the media is like you hear about like these major disasters like floods and famines and all this stuff happening in the, uh, the 1990s. And then you, uh, they kind of insinuate that North Korea never recovered. Yeah, that's not true. I mean, there obviously was a famine. Yeah, like there was. There's no denying that. They don't deny that either. They 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 have their own. I, it, it's a Korean word. I can't remember it, uh, which describes that period. The, I think it was called the. Uh, 
oh, I remember what it was. It was called the Arduous March, which is not to be right. confused with the Long March. Which under, China, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was basically saying, uh, remembering how bad things were, and that uh, they still came out of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were in the worst position. The Soviet Union was gone, so they and the Eastern Bloc was gone. Yeah, they lost about seventy-eight percent of their trade, which is absolutely devastating. If that, <laughs> if that were to happen to this country or the United States, particularly with the fact that it has a thirty-eight billion, uh, thirty-eight point five billion dollar trade deficit, yep, it would it would destroy us like practically overnight. Well, yeah, that's that's massive. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I think it says something to the cohesion of that particular society. Can it actually endure that? Yeah, that that's a that's a literal impossibility for our society to to survive. And a, a heat wave swept through and caused these damages because I don't see what the point how losing the trade with the Soviet Union would have actually caused a famine because the Soviet Union didn't determine whether or not crops grew. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a heat wave that struck uh, North Korea, which which bore the brunt of it. Uh, China got it a bit, and South Korea got it a bit. Yeah. Uh, by this time, you know, China was already wealthy enough that it, it just bought, like, incredible amounts of extra food from Vietnam. Mm-hmm. But it, it was fine. And South Korea just got whatever it could possibly want from the United from States. From the United States. And the Soviet Union gave, like, $500,000 to North Korea. That, that's, like, nothing. Like, yeah, for this? <laughs> that's, like, pocket change. Yeah. So they basically had to take this on by themselves. Mm-hmm. They did the best they could. And they, again, there's this perception that this is still going on to this day. You know, that's not true. There is malnourishment. There is, um, uh, people are not eating enough food, but there is not starvation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it seems like this is another one of these famine mythologies that we, I think we, t- we talked about this before uh, in our last interview. When we were talking about what happened in the in the uh, say the Great Leap Forward famine or the uh, the famine in the USSR in the early 1930s, and how the both of these events were kind of just used to just bash communism in general, when of course they were caused by the weather, yeah, like like overwhelmingly that was the reason for it. And both in both cases there was uh, major relief efforts and all this sort of things. People were not allowed to not deliberately caused to starve to death. Yeah, uh, even some more information came out about the famine in China. Um, the famine in China, the death rate during the famine was actually less than it would have been during the regular famines that occurred. Really? So, which means even <laughs> if, you know, if, uh, if Mao had never come to power, the famine still would have been worse. Well, yeah, because the rural infrastructure was just not set up to handle that sort of thing in the feudal period, like at all. No, it didn't, yeah, it didn't even exist. Yeah. <laughs> Like that's of course traditionally why you had the, uh, the the like so many famines, and so bad, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And these these famines still happen today in capitalist countries, but that doesn't count. Yeah. Um, yeah, because actually, um, this is a bit of a side note, but I actually did read uh, Mo Bo Gao's uh, Battle for China's Past. Um, like I think that was you, uh, the reason why I did that is because you brought that up in the last interview we did. And it's, it's really amazing, like just reading about the kind of gains that were made under the Cultural Revolution, which I had no idea about before. In, oh, yeah. in China, and, and this built up the rural infrastructure. There was never like a major famine after this. Um, rural industry was just, you know, went through the roof. I mean, everybody was uh, finally, you know, there's access to health care, access to education in the countryside. Like, it's, it's unbelievable, and these things were gradually demolished under Deng Xiaoping. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, the one-child policy is a, is a tremendous example. Uh, there, was, there was a restriction of families under revolutionary China, but their solution was, hey, here's abortions that you can get, yeah, and here's um, either subsidized or free birth control. Yeah. They, incent- they, they um, incentivized and created programs to help prevent a further expansion of the population, whereas under capitalism, under Deng Xiaoping, when the one-child policy came into effect, it was punishing people for having an extra child. Right. So, like, totally different. It was completely different. Yeah. But to this day, of course, China still, you know, communism is still blamed for what capitalism actually did. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is, this is capitalism coming in and introducing these kind of policies, like, in the 1980s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, like, it was, like, 1981 or something like that when the, um, when the one-child policy came in. I think it was somewhere around there. Yeah. And it was also a, a thing that I brought up, too, about gun control in China. Yeah. yeah. It came in about 1981. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mao died in 76. Yeah, because before then you had the, um, well, yeah, just about every community was armed, right? Like had the militias and all that kind of stuff under, in walked, the Cultural Revolution. People walked around factories with guns on them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know where you get this idea of Mao took the guns away. Oh, yeah, we were talking about that before. <laughs> yeah, to quote, uh, to quote Alex Jones. I mean, if you actually had that today, say you had a union, say if you had, uh, you know, the, the union for the, um, the people who offload, uh, I forget the name of the union, from, uh, the, from planes and stuff. Yep. Imagine if all those guys were walking around with guns on them. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine you went to, you know, a protest for an OPSU walkout and they're all standing there with handguns. And they're all standing there with handguns or like AK-47s or something, right? <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> imagine what would have happened. Yeah, it kind of changes the dynamic a little bit. Uh, but yeah, once like getting back to, to North Korea though, I mean, uh, once again, they have a very, um, I, I guess it's, it's totally understandable given the kind of, uh, pressure they've, they've experienced like this whole, uh, was it the army first policy, yeah, which they have? Uh, Song on. Yeah. So maybe if you just want to like, uh, maybe briefly describe what that's all about. Okay. Uh, when, uh, Kim Il-sung ran things, they had the GJ policy, which was self-reliance. Right. Uh, Basically, he was no dummy, and he knew that they were going to have to take this uh, take this alone. Uh, I believe he saw the Sino-Soviet split coming. Right. And their whole thing was like, okay, look, we either have to ally with China or we have to ally with the Soviet Union. Well, he said, well, screw that. We can't afford to take one side or the other. So they said, okay, now we've got, we've got Juche. Yeah. And Juche is a good idea. That's the thing. It played a double role of, you know, it was a plan to industrialize and it was to avoid that whole in conflict to begin with. This is as much as anybody, you know, within, within the international commerce community could. And that served them well, you know, up until, you know, a, a certain point. And then Kim, Jong, Kim Jong-il came in and they had the military first policy of, okay, we've gone relatively as far as we can go without a huge amount of international trade. And the pressure is back on us. They're coming at us with this. They're coming at us with that. So yeah. you could make the argument that it's a kind of a Keynesian thing where, you know, you know, it's investing in the country itself, through the military. Right. But uh, basically it was like the idea was that after they've gone through all of this, they're coming at any moment. Like the second Korean War is going to come soon. Of course, that didn't materialize. But... The thought was at the time that that could happen at any moment mm-hmm. when Kim Il Sung died. They thought, okay, this is it. This is when we can jump on them. Yeah. So they're saying, like, okay, we have to keep our military, like, basically just prep for battle, like, it, at the slightest, like, provocation. We have to keep things, keep ourselves ready. Yeah. We constantly have to be ready to go at any moment. Yeah. And they're still maintaining that footing right now. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which is unsurprising seeing the. Uh, it, like the war games that are going on in, in South Korea, they're still going on right now, right? Like, it, like for like like two months or something. Yes. Yeah, and this is the United States and South Korea, and um, basically all right on North Korea's doorstep, like vast like nuclear weapons, armed planes, and uh, and uh, basically simulated invasions and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it's like a, imagine opening your door, the front door to your house, and there's all your neighbors practicing. Killing you, right? To kill you. The road from your house. Yeah. yeah. You can imagine that would really <laughs> piss you off. Well, well yeah. Um, yeah, it made me a little bit uneasy, to say the least. And, um, and we're really surprised that North Korea wants to keep its nuclear arsenal under conditions like this. Well, of course not. They'd be fools to give it up. Yeah. I mean, uh, as, a, as a friend of mine uh, who goes to the University of Concordia actually pointed out, it's not... The, you know, having nuclear weapons isn't just, you know, a rational plan for defense, you know, where you can just say, like, look at everybody who was nuclear armed. You know, the United States didn't touch them, mm-hmm. except, of course, for Cuba. But there's a lot of criticisms that, that could be made in that situation. Yeah. But they know that if they have nuclear arms, that's the point where nobody's, nobody's really going to want to touch them. But, I mean, there's also a... a um, an economic rationality behind it. Uh, keeping a military armed, uh, yep. fully stocked and ready to go is very, very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and a single nuclear weapon is actually cheaper. Yeah. It, it's actually a more cost-effective uh, measure of defense. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, it can't actually, you know, take the place of a standing military inside the country, but it, it is more cost-effective overall. Yeah. 
And uh, when did the North Koreans actually make the decision to, okay, now we're going to develop nuclear warheads? I mean, it was always there. Mm -hmm. I'm imagining that even there since day one, it was always there. It was only a matter of developing to a point where they can afford to do that, to where they had the uh, knowledge and the technical capability. The technical capability being the, um, the, the, the major you know, block at this point. Uh, I mean, that would have always been. But yeah, technical know-how is uh, very is you know a major obstacle. Mm -hmm. But I believe that they've had it um, always in their sight, right? And they've made concessions here or there. And while they have made those concessions, I, I don't doubt for a second that the research continued. Yeah, because you know, although you can get some you can get some concessions now, in the long run, you're still dead if you don't have them. Mm -hmm. So it's a, matter, it's a realistic survival calculus, basically, mm -hmm. these guys have. Um, and obviously, there's been major technical process. I mean, I, I mean, the fact that they've been able to develop, like, uh, rocketry to the extent they can put a satellite in space and, like, you know, develop these, these very, very technically complex projects, even at a time when they're under severe sanctions. Like, I think that should tell us something about the kind of society we're dealing with here. And they think about the fact that they got into space before South Korea did. Yeah. And South Korea got all this, this space expertise and uh, assistance from the U.S. Mm hmm And they still managed to do it. And, they, and they, Yeah, and South Korea still has not put a satellite into space or done anything like that. Uh, they have done it. Um, they, they did it, I believe, uh, a week or two weeks after North Korea did. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. It's like, I mean, this was like the point of, okay, if they're so, you know, economically backward and they're stupid or whatnot, and they get into space and we don't, mm -hmm. that, that makes us look really bad. Yeah. Of course, with the North Korean launch having taken place, they didn't really hit the news all that much that South Korea had just done it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people had already assumed that it had already been done, that South Korea had already gotten a satellite into space, but it actually hadn't. Mm -hmm. So um, just in terms of like how uh, North Korea manages to maintain itself in this uh, this sort of capacity, I mean, you hear a lot about its, its relationship with China, but... Um, I don't th like that's that's not enough to really maintain uh, where it's at right now. It, like it does it does have trade relations with other countries, say in the third world, right? Yeah, uh, they're starting to strike a new deal for oil from Iran. Right. Iran had its sanctions placed, and no, we're not going to buy your fuel. So yeah, well, screw you. And they're like, okay, well, we need a customer for this. Who needs oil? Well, North Korea has sanctions against it for oil. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, basically, the U.S. just gave them that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the relationship between North Korea and China can be complicated, mm -hmm. but basically China has what it wants. China likes the way things the way they are because it's beneficial to them. Uh, the Chinese can uh, you know, uh, export some of its manufacturing to North Korea and have yep. it done cheaper the same way the U.S. sends manufacturing to China. Um, China is almost the exclusive purchaser of all the rare earth metals and stuff that comes out of the DPRK. Yep. The U.S. comes over, it takes over, that's gone. Yeah, and of course that means um, American troops right on China's border as well. Yeah. So China has a definite vested interest in keeping a war from happening. They're actually very happy with the way things are now. They want them to stay the same. Right. Which is why they said, you know, we won't tolerate anybody attacking anybody. Uh, you know, over the, uh, the attacking, well, tolerate the U.S. and North Korea going to war because they literally don't want it to happen. Right. They have things the way they are that's beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. Is that necessarily the best thing for North Korea? Probably not. But, you know, China has its own interests. And it just so happens that in this particular situation, it's, 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 it's convenient to North Korea. Yeah. Um, because one of the things I was, I was going to bring up, the fact that uh, and, and this might, of course, hinge on why uh, one of the reasons why the United States is, ho is so hostile uh, to North Korea in the first place. I believe that was one of the that was the place where uh, the United States suffered its last major battlefield defeat yes. in the hands of, I believe it was the it was the Chinese and North Koreans uh, effectively destroyed pretty much an entire U.S. army. Yeah, I mean, you know, aside from Vietnam, of course, but uh, in terms of you know large scale regular warfare. Yeah, yeah. that's that's what I meant. Yeah, the um, it was one of those situations where they just uh, they couldn't win. 
you know, when you're fighting for your home, you're always going to be fighting harder than when you're trying to occupy somebody else. Mm-hmm. It always means that different. And um, it's hard to say whether or not they perceive it as a loss because, well, they just say it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Even though literally it was. It's like when they declared that the War of 1812 wasn't a loss for the U.S., but <laughs> it was. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. even get that. Like, I've seen that in U.S. textbooks. It's like, we attacked, didn't take over, we won. And they won. What? Yeah. <laughs> How do you work that? It's like, what is that? How? Uh, but um, let me see. Like, I just wanted to, like, in your estimation, because, of course, we've seen, like, it, so many socialist countries kind of go um, go belly up and uh, their elites making deals and uh, adopting capitalism and this sort of thing in the aftermath of, uh, say, 1989. So why would you, in your estimation, would North Korea not go that way? Why would it maintain itself? I think it has a lot to do with the fact that they are just so bloody stubborn. They just <laughs> do not want to sell out. They just do not want to give up. Mm. The, um, the national cohesion there is incredibly strong. And to them, independence is, is, is more important than death. I mean, you know, like... like um, you know, like, uh, what's the U.S. saying in uh, New Hampshire? It's on their license plate. You know, give me liberty. Give me liberty, give me death, right? Uh, they live that. They live that. To, they, they want their independence or they they will die. Yeah, like, that's that's basically the spirit that exists there. Yeah, because it don't, what it actually reminds me of is the fact that there, there's so few socialist countries in the world today, and they almost remind me of... Um, those cu- few countries in the 19th century that resisted colonization. Like, uh, talk like, um, in particular, I'm thinking of Ethiopia. That was one of the few places that actually, re- like, it actually inflicted a major defeat on, I believe it was Italy, when the, uh, they tried to colonize it and they actually resisted all attempts. It's one of the few examples of that. And that kind of reminds me of, uh, of, say, places like North Korea, which are still holding out and very doggedly maintaining the, say, the Marxist-Leninist, you know, kind of... It's really become part of their identity. Yes, and they're they're fighting for this. Uh, they're just it's it's part of their identity. It's it's not going to go away. Yeah. Because how would you compare that to say Cuba? Like in how it's kind of maintained itself. Cuba has Cuba has a different set of has a different set of conditions, a, a different set of material conditions surrounding its situation. Uh, for one, you can't portray Cuba as a military threat to anyone. Yeah. It's just not possible. I believe the famous line was, um, they, were, they were telling, uh, I can't remember his name, in Mexico all those years ago, to say that uh, Cuba was an imminent threat. And he said, if we do that, then uh, millions of Mexicans will die laughing. Yeah, they'll, they'll all laugh at us. It, it just won't work. It, it, it's very hard to... It has a lot to do with the imagery around it. Cuba it doesn't have, like, a very... It has a different, like... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, connotation to it. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a sunny, bright place. It's the Caribbean, and, you know, Che's awesome, and everybody loves him, and... Yeah, the, the symbolism around it and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas North Korea has a very different uh, symbolism around it. Mm -hmm. Because I've noticed that just because the... um, Certainly you get like the various sectors on the left who are very um, hostile in general to communism, but they make an exception for Cuba. That seems to be the general rule. Like if you're talking like Noam Chomsky or somebody like that. Cuba has the image of we we want to live in peace. Please stop stop doing what you're doing to us. Yeah. We're trying to live in peace. And North Korea is like, if you don't back off, we're going to effing kill you. (laughs) I mean, they come out very militaristically, like, like, screw you, we are going to do what we want. Whereas Cuba often seems more, has more of an air of a victim around it. I mean, I'm not saying that they're not a victim. They are definitely a victim of uh, imperialism, but they appear to be a victim to everybody else. Whereas North Korea isn't seen as a victim of U.S. aggression. Right. Because uh, Cuba seems to have, like, kind of, uh, well, it certainly has benefited in recent years because uh, the increasing integration of Latin America and the... Uh, um, that entire region, of course, has been victimized by U.S. imperialism for 200 years and seems to be kind of unifying in a way that really integrates Cuba and increasingly shuts the United States out. 
So it's almost like this international alliance system is kind of keeping Cuba in a um, kind of a float in a way that, say, North Korea can't rely on. Yeah. Because it, it does have a homogeny with the rest of Latin America that mm. the, uh, the Asian countries don't share. Yeah. Um, the, the relationship between Venezuela and Cuba has been you know, of an astronomical benefit. Yeah. I mean, it's just been, uh, it's just been a, a godsend for Cuba to have this relationship, whereas North Korea is, uh, it's not as alone as people think it is. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, there is an anti-imperialist bloc, although however small, uh, Iran, Syria, North Korea, and probably some other ones. Mm-hmm. They're, they're kind of like, that, uh, they're basically they're standing up, at the so-called rogue states, so to speak. Yeah. yeah you know, called rogue states. Yeah, in, in U.S. foreign policy jargon. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, they've almost been forced to come together like by default, just to give them the immense amount of pressure placed on them. Yeah, I, I noticed, uh, I noted uh, recently that Iran has a largely Islamic society. It yeah, has, you know, Islamic influence laws, but it is still you know f- fairly secular, given the fact that it, that it's uh, it's in the Middle East, and where has, North Korea has a straight out completely secular you know atheist government, mm-hmm. and yet they're still cooperating. Yeah, and I guess and I guess they weren't before, um, really before the axis of evil speech. I mean, I don't think there was really any cooperation whatsoever. But uh, it seems like after that period of time, now it's like because of all this pressure on us. Well, who else are we going to trade with? Yeah, you know, except for this 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 other guy who are kind of in the same shoes as I am. You know, even though they have a very different system, they, they might they might as well have just you know made them shake hands. You, you, yeah, you, you make this list. Okay, here's all the people we're going to go after. Well, you might as well just introduce each other on the spot. Yeah, like here's a new. Yeah, basically they had, that basically is going to become an alliance by default because there's no other way it can be. Exactly. Yeah. In terms of survival. So really, I know this is really, really hard to do, but like how, how would you say that this, uh, this current dispute is going to, is going to turn out? Like how, what are your projections for the re- say this year about like what's going to happen? Actually, I don't think there's going to be a war mm-hmm. uh, because I'm, China's already sent military ships into the, uh, the waters between the two countries. Yeah, like the Yellow Sea. Uh, officially, they're denying it. I don't know why, but, you know, the photos are there. The reports are there. Yeah. Like, we know it's there. Like, I don't know what, what's the point of saying it's not. Um, China has things the way they want it. And any destabilization of North Korea, particularly in, in the hands of imperialist interests, is extremely bad for them. I, was, I think that if, if it was to accelerate further, China would most likely place a, uh, a no-fly zone uh, you know, sort of around the country. If anybody tries to fly in and out without their permission, they're going to shoot them down. Yeah, like that's like if like red line. Korean, if North Korean bombers take off, they're going to get shot down. Or if U.S. warplanes fly in, they're going to shoot them down. Mm-hmm. Because they don't want the war to happen. They don't need North Korea to fall. They need it to stay the way the way it is. Mm-hmm. And they have a vested interest in keeping it that way. And if if North Korea was to fall to U.S. hands. China just could not allow that. I mean, even if there was an invasion, China would rush in to make sure that their interests were defended. China doesn't particularly want to go to war with the United States, and the United States doesn't particularly want to go to war with China. But, again, we have the competing opposing interests, and, you know, in the course of the dialectic, they're going to go up against each other. Right. And that, out of necessity, is going to force them to go at each other. And that was pretty much the same situation that led to China's involvement in the Korean War in the first place. Uh, I would say that one was uh, largely solidarity as well, mm-hmm. because they, they wanted that solidarity too. Of course, I mean, of course, it was definitely in their interest, and they, they had complete total interest that they had to keep. But it wasn't the same thing as it is now. There, they had an interest in keeping a free, independent North Korea, as opposed to now, where they need them as a, a source of minerals and labor. Mm-hmm. So, but, yeah, because back then, I, I believe it was basically a volunteer force that went into Korea. It was. It was the Chinese force. They called on for internationalist volunteers. Mm-hmm. And I believe it was one of Mao's sons who actually died in that war. Yeah. Because that was a, like, it was hundreds of thousands of Chinese who went. It was, uh, was it across the Yellow River? Uh, it was three the Yalu River, I think it was. Like, that's the one that's on the border of, um, of Korea and China, right? Yeah, it was yeah. 300,000 Chinese troops made it across the border of the Yellow River. And U.S. intelligence had no record of it happening. 
And I guess that was what led to the major, um, which I believe happened from a surprise attack, which led to the destruction of uh, much of an American army, and it's it's basically routing. Yeah. And like, yeah. But that was always the big thing. They got 300,000 troops across that river, and the U.S. had no record of it ever happening. Mm-hmm. Like, they had no idea that it was there. Which I always thought was pretty amazing. Well, yeah, that, that is pretty amazing. Troops to move without being noticed. <laughs> yeah, uh, but certainly because you have, um, you do actually have a uh, contact in the uh, North Korean government. Uh, yes, I do. I uh, I am in I am in contact with the uh, foreign ministry. Mm-hmm. In fact, I was uh, I got some things that I have to finish up first and deal with, and then there I, I've actually been invited to go. Really? <laughs> wow. Well, certainly, if that if that does does come to pass, like we're definitely gonna have to talk about that uh, after that after you after you return. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. Wow. Kind of the videos while I'm there. Yeah, because that's like that's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, it's one of these things. I've I've actually wanted to do that as well. It's just it's it's quite um it's it's rather hard to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm yeah, certainly special time like this. I'm being invited. You know, they're inviting me to go where they're offering to pay for the trip and everything. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. So, like, how do you do that? Do you, like, pretty much go, have to go through China, or is, is that about the only way you can really get there? Um, yeah. Um, the North Korean airline doesn't go very far, and they're like, oh, look how poor it is. Well, no, not really, when you consider a lot of the countries around it will well, given the, shoot their planes down if they do. Yeah. Uh, China, Russia, and they do have flights to, I believe it's Thailand. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So either one of those uh, places I'll have to go to first, uh, probably China. Mm-hmm. Well, so that's going to be absolutely amazing, though. I'm mean, getting to see this firsthand because I know I was like seeing a, um, uh, like the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist Leninists had a whole delegation that went there a few years back and like brought back a whole uh, report on what happened and actually like you know actual experience that they had in that country. And they, I guess, they had pretty much had free reign. They pretty much could go wherever they wanted to. So they actually got to see the countryside firsthand, uh, the cities, like basically anything they wanted. It's yeah. like, yeah. So, I mean, um, I'd say, like, try to bring back some documentation, that's for sure. I'm, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that. Yeah, um, I did manage, he, the foreign ministry did manage to give me a document that outlined a uh, civil law proceeding in uh, North Korea. Really? Like how the, uh, uh, how trials and, you know, convictions and stuff like that works. Mm-hmm. Because you did a video one time, I think, on mar- marijuana laws or something like that in North North Korea? Yes. It was quite interesting. Yeah, their general attitude is, like, if it doesn't affect your work, they don't care what you're doing. Right. Like Which is could, <laughs> pretty like, relaxed compared like to you, us. You could drink a lot. As long as it didn't actually affect your work, then, like, if you weren't, you know, stumbling down the you know, streets at 2 o'clock in the morning, they'd... As long as you weren't doing things like that, as long as it wasn't interfering with your job, they basically don't care. Wow. <laughs> like, like, it's fairly common for uh, farmers to make, um, uh, like, like uh, corn liquor. Yeah. I, I forget exactly what it is, but, they, like, distilling their own liquor. And it's like, technically it's illegal, but they don't, they don't really enforce it that much. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so once again, all this stuff that, and I, I think like, this is the kind of, once again, we need to see the human... The humanity of, North, of, say, the North Korean people. That's really what needs to be, needs to be seen right now. Because, I mean, like, we really need to bust through so many of these myths. They're yeah. so destructive. Yeah, one of the most common ones, uh, one of the most, I mean, the common symbols of, you know, you know daily, regular life is uh, that one uh, crossing the line with, you know, Joe Dresnok. Yeah. Where he's, you know, he's retired and he's sitting there with his friends, you know, on the side of the, the, side of the river fishing. And they're just sitting there drinking, smoking, and eating the fish that they catch. Yeah. You know, it's, it's 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 a very simple thing, mm-hmm. but it it it's there. Like they don't do crazy parties and stuff like that. It's somebody's birthday, they go they go to somebody's house, they get hammered, they have a good time, and yeah. you know, that's it. Yeah, it's 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 not elaborate, huge things, but it's basically you know regular you know family stuff. Yeah, and once again, yeah, because this is this is socialism, right? Yeah, this is what this is what they do. Yeah, well, unfortunately, it looks like we're kind of uh, we're about out of time now. But I mean, uh, I want to thank you very much, Jason, for coming on. And well, once again, we got to do this again. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So thank you very much. Okay. See you later. Okay. Take care. Bye. 
Okay, so that was Jason Unruh of, of uh, Maoist Rebel News here on uh, back in the USSR talking about North Korea. So we're going to be back after this short break. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> 